Hello, I'm Bob Shingleton and welcome to a very special edition of Chance Music. Previous programmes have taken me to a medieval church in Norwich to talk to Jordi Saval, to the south coast of England to interview Jonathan Harvey. But today is the first time Chance Music has gone overseas and as you will hear from the background sounds, this programme is being recorded in a 15th century apartment in the beautiful city of Avignon in the south of France. Avignon is famous as the home of the popes in medieval times and since then has been celebrated by countless schoolchildren in the song Sur le Pont d'Avignon. But this beautiful ward city is also the home of composer and new technology guru Jeff Harrington and I have travelled here to talk to Jeff about his colourful career and also to hear some of his music. Jeff is big on new technology so it's quite appropriate that he and I first met when we clashed online in 2005 about the role of the internet in music distribution. He responded to an article I'd written with the following words and they're a pretty good summary of his philosophy. The internet in my opinion represents probably the greatest positive change in how independent artists communicate with audiences. Jeff was born in the south of the United States in Forest, Mississippi. He taught himself blues and boogie-woogie piano in high school and built a synthesizer for fun. He began composing when he was 17 and his early musical influences include blues and New Orleans funk. He went on to attend the prestigious Juilliard School in New York. The influences on his mature output range from jazz and African-American music to the classical gods of Haydn, Mozart and Beethoven. He writes in a tonal idiom for both acoustic and electronic instruments and his compositions have been performed around the world from Siberia to St. Louis. If Jeff had confined himself to composing it would be a pretty impressive career but he is a true 21st century man and his other activities include website creation, computer programming and games design and he's also a computer graphics artist. Jeff Harrington, welcome to Chance Music. Thanks Bob, it's really great to be here. Jeff, let's start by talking about your early years. While you were studying in New York, you worked at Liberty Music on Madison Avenue and there you met Frank Sinatra. Can you tell us a bit about that? One of the few uh, opportunities that a composer has, or anybody that has that is uh, educated in classical music, is uh, a job in, a, in the retail sector, either in a classical music record store or maybe in a, in a music library. The, uh, the opportunities in New York, I, I had to pay the rent when I dropped out, when I, I was forced to drop out of Juilliard when I ran out of money. And so I took a job in a, at Sam Goody's where I met Morton Feldman too. That was a very interesting experience. And then I later on, after about three months at Sam Goody's on 46th Street, I, uh, I found an opportunity at Liberty Music, which was the first record store in the world. And they had slowly phased out their record collection, but they're interested in bringing back a strong classical selection just so they could sell high-end audio. Anyways, one day Frank Sinatra came in with his two bodyguards looking very mafioso, and th they were both huge gentlemen, obviously packing some serious uh, God knows what. And uh, he was looking for a high-end uh, stereo for Nancy's son. And he, he laid out $3,000 cash, and, and uh, we delivered it to his house and set it up for him. It was very interesting, and the salespeople were very uh, florid in their approach to him. It was fascinating.
was Jeff Harrington's Piano Prelude Number no. 3 in 19 equal 10 increment, and it was performed by Aaron Calais. Jeff is my guest here on today's Chance Music, and we were just talking about his time in New York at the Juilliard School. Jeff, when you were at the Juilliard, your teachers included Elliot Carter and Roger Sessions. What are your memories of those great names? Uh, Elliot Carter was, had just turned 70, and uh, we had a kind of difficult time bonding at first until I started writing a song cycle of Elizabeth Bishop poems. And just coincidentally, I had picked the exact same poems that he had picked for his Elizabeth Bishop song cycle. And we instantly st started beginning each lesson with a, with a short talk about what uh, modern American poetry we had just read. I was very interested in Wallace Stevens and uh, John Ashbery, and he, and he had just finished setting Syringa, the John Ashbery song cycle. So we would begin each lesson with, with talks about philosophy or poetry, and then go on to the piece that I was working on at the time. And it was a, it was a fascinating experience. One memory I had about uh, uh, studying with Mr. Carter was that <coughs> I, I um, was always, always a little disturbed by how hard-edged atonal music uh, was, seemed to be connected with a kind of existential kind of angst. And I, being from New Orleans, I was kind of, of a more of a kind of easygoing kind of, kind of fellow. And, you know, lazy les bon temps roule kind of thing. And I asked him, you know, what if you don't feel existential angst? What if you want to write music that expresses joy or some other emotion? And he goes, Jeff, if you do that, you'll never have a music career. to Amor Loco, an improvisation for quarter tone piano and electronics by Jeff Harrington. Jeff, 20 years ago you retracted almost all of the music you'd written. Why was that? When I uh, we ended up in New Orleans after 
leaving uh, New York in a, one very cold winter. And I was living in New Orleans, and I started composing music again after uh, I was a little bit bitter after I dropped out of Juilliard. I even was a visual artist for a little while. And when I finally got back to, to composing, uh, something horrible happened to my brother committed suicide. And I decided then that I, I wanted to, to, to do something that I'd flirted with uh, just conceptually my whole life, which was trying to write tonal music. And I knew it was going to be painful and very difficult and it was going to be awkward. But I, but I began and I started off kind of stronger than I ended up, but I wrote six symphonies, five string quartets, uh, started an opera, and I ended up throwing them all away uh, about 20 years ago just because after looking back at them, I saw that they were a, a kind of primitive kind of juvenilia and that, I, and that throughout the pieces, I kept two, two of the pieces, throughout the pieces had a weakness which was that I hadn't been raised in an environment where this kind of melodism was, uh, was strong, that the, that the types of melodies that I was accustomed to were the rock and roll and the blues melodies, and that was my strength.
That was Blue Stride of a Piano by Jeff Harrington, performed by Paul Hoffman. And I'm Bob Shimberton, and you're listening to Chance Music on Future Radio, 107.8 FM in Norwich, England, and streaming worldwide on the internet. Today's program is coming from the home of composer and new technology guru Jeff Harrington in the historic city of Avignon in France. Jeff, I want to return to your mature music a little later, but first, let's move from composing to your adventures in new technology. You were in at the start of computer games and you created the first online games for Sesame Street, I think. Music for computer games is big business today, but how did you view those early Sesame Street creations? Were they just standalone breadwinners or did they somehow link to your composing? I've always looked at, at computer programming as a possible uh, component for, a, for the creation of a, kind of, of a new kind of venue for the, for the promotion and distribution of my music. The, the opportunity that the internet provides composers now is, is so vast, but a lot of times you have to have, you have to create a kind of uh, experience that is a multimedia experience and not just click and listen to. So I, whenever I wrote these games, I always looked at it as being uh, a, something I, I might be able to use later on down the road for creating that type of multimedia experience. just listening to Erk for mandolin and guitar played by Dior Alhot und Schwab and it was written by Jeff Harrington who is my guest here today on Chance Music. Jeff, coming back to your more serious music after talking about Sesame Street, in the early 1990s you wrote a computer program which created counterpoint from melodies. That's a pretty arcane thing to create. Can you explain in simple terms how it works and what its use is? When I was working in the record store uh, in New Orleans, I was writing a string quartet for my master's degree, 
and I was sitting there performing these calculations like just like Bach had done, try, trying to write canons, and it occurred to me that it, this was basically a mathematical problem. And I started thinking about how you would write a program that would solve these problems for you because basically it's, it's a search algorithm. So what I, when I finally got around to writing the program, I created a system which would, would take uh, between three and six tracks of music and basically uh, one by one first look for duos and by transposing and also delaying the, the second line of music, once it found duos, save those transpositions and those time displacements and go on and look for trios and do the same kind of time displacement and transposition then. I eventually wrote it so it could do up to six uh, tracks of music and I used it in a, in a fair number of pieces. for solo violin performed by Piotr Shevchik and the composer was Jeff Harrington who's here with me on Chance Music today. Jeff, in my introduction um, I explained how back in 2005 you were a passionate advocate of the internet as a music distribution platform. In the five years that have passed since then, do you think you've improved right? I think I have. I think that the problems that we had back then in 2005 are still with us though, and problems of curation. How do, how do we separate the wheat from the chaff? And, and also, how do we make sure that when we stumble up upon a, a, a piece of music that we like, that, we, that it's easy to share it with other people? 
there, what's occurred in the last five years is this explosion of different types of sites that allow for playlist creation and playlist promotion in addition to, to uh, MP3 uh, promotion. But, but now we're faced with uh, further kind of complexifying of, of how the, the curation itself is getting lost at the same time as the MP3 blogs are disappearing because of threats from uh, industry. <laughs> for cello and piano performed by the Cross Island Ensemble, composed by Jeff Harrington. Jeff, let's talk about the distribution model for your own music. On your website, um, there are lots of MP3 downloads. Looking at the scores, some are available free as Adobe Acrobat files, and others have to be bought. How does that work? Well, the, the, the scores that have to be bought typically are, are by uh, uh, performing groups that have their own publishing companies and they've asked for uh, permission to, to, to sell the scores. They often sell the scores at concerts or at conventions. I also sell my scores online so if you want to buy it, you can, if you want to buy a printed copy, you can buy it or you can download it for free and print it out yourself. So that convenience allows me to uh, sell a few scores. <laughs>
Turbillon by Jeff Harrington for six harps, contrabass and percussion. And Jeff, staying uh, with the internet, you recently stirred up some controversy by saying that classical music lacked bass. Can you explain what you meant? Well, growing up in New Orleans and experiencing rock music and, and, and um, blues music, I, uh, I was accustomed to having music be a visceral experience, you know, something you would feel in your body to it. it it stirred you to dance or, or what have you. And when I first started getting interested in classic music, and I wasn't re really interested in classic music until I was in my early 20s that it finally started resonating with me, I felt it very odd that, that such powerful music would be performed, but it, but it wouldn't be performed in a manner that could stir the audience to that same kind of visceral experience. And it's it just, it's been kind of a, a meme of mine, which is that the problem with classical music is that it's just, it just isn't enough bass. There isn't enough visceral quality to it. That was Kaleido Psychotropos, performed by New Music Works, Santa Cruz, California, in March 2007. The composer was Jeff Harrington. Jeff, before moving on to your recent music, I want to ask you about Avignon. We're recording this chance music program in Provence, rather than on Sanibel Island in Florida, where you lived before. Why? We, we left Sanibel after a couple of factors. One of the factors was that it, it was a very high-end retirement community, although it was extremely beautiful, very very preserved, and uh, almost uh, miraculous in the number of birds and wildlife it has. When the oil spill hit, we decided that enough was enough. We're, I'm a, a little concerned about how America is, is being controlled by the corporations, and it, I just had this gut feeling that no matter how bad the oil spill was or wasn't, that it was going to be a gateway for more drilling and eventually lead to the to the uh, destruction of, of the island. And we, we, we just, we'd always flirted with the idea of moving to France. We'd been trying to do it since Reagan got elected, in fact. 
And so we decided just to go ahead and, and risk the money and just come here and uh, hopefully save and recoup the money by not having to pay health insurance because my wife's a French citizen. That was Adagio Tenebroso, performed in 2006 in Paris at the Cave. The composer was Jeff Harrington. Jeff is here with me today on Chance Music. And Jeff, you write for acoustic and electronic instruments. Um, your works include string quartets and piano preludes. Isn't that a little surprising for a new technology guy? Well, I find that the electronic music has, has a, uh, it's a real problem to it because there's no at this point, there's no good way to, to, to get across the kind of uh, energy and vitality that the performer brings to acoustic music. The, uh, the composer, of course, c can perform electronic music, but one of, the, one of the cool things about electronic music is that you can have arbitrary speeds, arbitrary volumes and stuff, and performing things that are that complex takes as, and learning the, the part takes as much time as the composition itself. So a lot of times composers cut corners and have the electronic parts be realized by a computer. The thing about acoustic music too is that it's, I think it's gonna be much easier to preserve, although digital music uh, seems to be, uh, to have an infinite lifespan, the reality of it is that electronic music, because it, it, we still haven't solved problems of digital archiving, it is a problem that's yet to be solved and it's more likely to disappear than a, 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 a printout of a score.
that last track, Jeff Harrington was talking about acoustic music, and uh, on that track we heard his Acid Bark 3 for quarter tone synthesizer. Jeff, let's turn now to your electronic music. Um, we've just heard an excerpt from your intriguingly titled Acid Bark. Can you tell us more about it? Acid Bark was a series of preludes in quarter tone temperament and I had used a uh, customized counterpoint program to come up with these canons or cano that had canonical sections. And I, I wanted to have a clever title for it because the pieces, uh, as you can see, have a very uh, stirring kind of quality to it. And so I came up with a kind of a, just kind of a joke title, but at the same time, a lot of times joke titles uh, resonate to a certain degree and help people to remember the piece, and I wanted to have a good title for this piece. It's kind of a joke, but I grew up with acid rock, and so acid boxing to be an obvious kind of pun. 